Welcome to the Centralized News, where you can tune in for exciting crypto updates. We'll cover a number of exciting topics today, including the U.S. banking meltdown, macro news, crypto adoption, and chain news. This is not financial advice. Please do your own research, and let's get right into it. It's been a bit weak. We'll start here on 3.9. Silvergate Bank announces it will shut down and liquidate assets. How are you doing, Ozzy? Do you see this? This is a big week. We started off with this. Yeah, that's it. It's been a huge week. This was the start of a whole chain of events that have spilled into the weekend and into today, Monday, March 13th. So pretty big week. I'm, I'm excited to dive into this news. Silvergate, for those of you who don't know, was probably one of the bigger banks involved with crypto and had a, as we reported last week, they shut down their SEN network, which allowed instantaneous deposits and withdrawals from crypto exchanges into their bank. So after much consideration and a whole bunch of other issues, they decided that they were going to willingly shut down and liquidate their assets. This kind of spurred a whole kind of bank run on, on banks in the U.S. with Silicon Valley Bank, which is probably the biggest bank, if not the biggest bank for startups and tech. It was really big for that kind of investment. They were shut down by the California state regulator. So this is the very next day on 310. So on 39, we had Silvergate shut down. Then 310, Silicon Valley Bank gets shut down by California regulators. Yeah, go ahead. And then that same day on 310, USDC depegs down to 88 cents on some exchanges. On most exchanges, I think it hit about 91. It varied a little bit. Because USDC or their parent company Circle had about three some odd billion dollars sitting in Silicon Valley Bank. And at the time, no one was sure when or if they were going to be able to recover that money. And so that was a huge thing. But as USDC depegged, it caused a huge amount of fear around a number of stable coins with DAI also depegging to about 88 cents. MIM, Magic Internet Money, depegged. And USDD, yeah, USDD also depegged. DAI is an algo stable coin and it's backed with USDC as part of its collateralization. It also uses USDT and some other stable coins. That's part of why DAI depegged. USDT did not depeg and BUSD did not depeg either. So that was an interesting. USDT kind of depegged, but on the upside a little bit. Yeah, everyone was moving their stables over to USDT, but not, uh, it wasn't a significant, like it didn't right. really lose the value of a dollar. If you look at it on most of the charts, it, it might, it, it looks like it hit about a dollar and a cent at one point. But nothing major across most exchanges. Not like the 0.88 DPEG on the downside for the others. Yeah, exactly. So uh, that was that was the weekend, and uh, that kind of started Friday, and it basically spilled all the way through the weekend. And they're always wondering what's what's going to happen. And then I heard this quote through this weekend, which I thought was really interesting. It's like the market can stop freaking out when regulators and when regulators start freaking out. And so we had from treasury department, the fed, um, the white house. So the regulators started freaking out and that's, I thought that was just an interesting quote anyway. And then all, over the weekend, there was some big news from these players, but part of it was signature bank also shut down, shut down by New York regulators. Yeah, citing yeah. systematic systematic re risk. They were a big bank for stable coins. And so that yeah, fiat uh, on ramp. But like at the same time, the joint statement from the Department of Treasury, the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System, the Fed, and the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, the FCIC, came out with a joint addressing all these issues. And saying that investors would be made whole and that most of the money would be available to people that were involved in SVB as of Monday. So as of today, we haven't heard anything to the contrary of people being able to get their funds out at the time of this recording, but that's still something to watch. They aren't bailing people out though. They aren't bailing out the bank with taxpayer funds and stakeholders and bondholders are not 
being refunded. So if you were a shareholder in, in that bank, then you're not getting your money back. And certain unsecured debt holders will not be protected either. So this is an important and everyone was thinking, oh, they're going to bail out the banks again, but they've made a, a decision not to do that while still protecting investor, basically depositors. At the same yeah. time, I think we should also note Bank stocks within the U.S. and across the U.S. are down from as much as 76% for the Western Alliance Bank Corporation and the First Republic Bank, which is down 67%. But we've also got non-U.S. banks such as Credit Suisse, which, are, which is down almost 10% on the day. Yeah, the banking stocks are looking like altcoins. Yeah, Charles Schwab, Schwab is down almost 20% on the day. And most bank stocks are down anywhere between 18 to 27% uh, today with a few others that are either a little bit higher or a little bit lower from there. Speaking of the banking system, the Fed also announced, it was, I believe it was a separate statement just from the Fed, but around the same time. And there was mention of it in the joint statement, but they actually named it. The Fed announced the bank term funding program, which is going to bottom line make liquidity available for other banks in the future so that this doesn't happen and make funding available. There was also some talk about the discount window and making it easier to use that. Basically just increasing liquidity for banks to stop more for better bank run. Yeah, uh, there's a big important kind of statement about a lot of this is that they're essentially seeing that social media has, poses a greater risk to banks' liquidity, just like we've seen in DeFi and in crypto for at least over a year now. So... A sentiment can cause a bank run, but they're creating this backstop of liquidity, looks like. Yeah, to try and basically ensure that that this doesn't happen to the banks again. Because even over the weekend, there was some talk that you pull all your money out from the banks, put it under your mattress, because that's a safer spot to put it right now. That, that's how crazy the conversations had gotten. Yeah, the president came out and spoke this morning. Are you yeah. Yeah. The fact that he had to come out and say that, it's a big deal. And th this announcement is a big deal. And the implications of it, it's hard to parse it all out right away, but it's a big announcement. Yeah, so Biden, President Biden came out this morning and basically re reiterated a message that had been basically spoken by his staff and by the Fed and other government agencies throughout the weekend, especially on Sunday, basically saying that the banking system is safe despite what just happened. There isn't a need to worry. So this is pretty interesting, really huge thing. I've had a couple of interesting conversations around this. I was on Jesse Eccles' podcast, The Obsidian Table, on Friday. And part of the accusation about how Silvergate basically had to decide to shut down their doors and SVB was Elizabeth Warren, a standing senator, basically accusing them of being in dirty dirty business and committing crimes and being in bed with crime so that was like very interesting and then we've also had conversations of hey the big all of the things that have collapsed in the last year and a half were essentially they were banks the ftx collapsed and it wasn't because of crypto. It was because it was basically a bank, an untransparent bank. And has been talking about that. And we're seeing that more and more across multiple, multiple kind of discussions on Twitter. What do you well, think? It's, the whole thing is just fascinating. And while all this is going on, the Bitcoin price started off down early in the week, like 3.9, 3.10. And then it started coming up. When the debates happened, money started rolling into Bitcoin, it seemed like. Then when the Fed made these announcements, it's pumping hard right now. Things have changed as far as Fed expectations and what they're going to do at the next meeting. They have, and they're having an emergency meeting right now like, while we're recording this, which is the first time I've seen since I've been reporting on the news where there's an emergency meeting. CP, we have CPI coming out soon. So there's just a lot of moving pieces 
right now. Yeah, we should talk a little bit about expectations. Another thing that's fueled everything that's been going on this week is Jerome Powell was testifying before Congress on Tuesday and Wednesday. And he had a pretty hawkish speech. The expectations went from 0.25 to where people were expecting like 0.5. Yeah, it had jumped from... If you remember our last show, we were talking about expectations of being 75% quarter basis point, 25%, half a basis point to 70%, half a basis point and 30% a quarter basis point in the matter of a few hours with expectations having shifted from a terminal rate somewhere between five and a half and five and three quarters to a terminal rate of between five and three quarters and six and a half with interest rates not really not pulling back and increasing through June and July, potentially even into September on some forecasts. So that was a massive pivot in the market and that really contributed yeah, to some downside. Like all the bad expectations chart and to the point where now I've even like on the map that there won't be any raise to the interest rate in the next meeting. It, it, like. The market's not necessarily expecting that, but it's at least on the map now. The 25% of the market is now expecting no Fed rate hike at this next meeting. So after this whole week, like we started the week basically really bumping expectations and now expectations have now dropped and flipped the other way. We're now talking of a quarter, 25% of forecasters are not expecting a rate hike this next meeting. And 75% of forecasters are expecting only a quarter basis point hike. No forecasters are expecting a 50 basis point hike. Go ahead. Sorry. And now expectations are that the terminal rate might be five and a quarter percent stopping in as early as May or June, depending if we pause and having rates pull back as soon as July or September. We're talking about a massive pivot in expectations. So you have the Fed kind of creating possibly QE is using different language with these big announcements and then a potential pivot coming sooner, you know, what it means for these risk on assets like Bitcoin. But then at the same time, the banks, all the banks that closed related to crypto and it's a lot harder, especially in the United States. And I know I'm experiencing it personally to get fiat to onboard fiat. So it's bullish and the market's pumping, but at the same time, there's this other side of it with the whole choke point 2.0 and putting pressure on the banking system to limit the liquidity that can come in. Yeah, it's just a, it's been a very interesting week, weekend for sure. Absolutely. We're seeing quite a different market compared to last week. And I think it could be a little bit of a rollout towards, hey, we're coming out with our own CBDC and our new stablecoin regulations. But we'll, if we're going to see from here, if we look at the economic calendar for this week, expectations could still roller coaster this week. We thought last week was a roller coaster. This week is likely to be even greater roller coaster with CPI coming out probably just before this episode is released this week expectations are for a increase of 0.4 last month was 0.5 and core cpi coming in at 0.4 the same as last month which this could be a huge determiner of what happens next like next week whether expectations on fed rate interest rates change even drastically again if they come in above expectations so we see 0.5 or even 0.6 cpi then we're you're likely seeing expectations for rate hikes jump again but if they come down if they're at expectations or below preferably below where you're likely to see it essentially reaffirm the current direction in Fed interest rate expectations. So that's just one piece on Tuesday, March 14th. March 15th, we've got retail sales and PPI, producer price index. So we're ex- expectations are that should drop even more this month. So we're hoping to see that come down. We've got the home builders survey and jo- on that day as well. But 
Thursday, we've got initial jobless claims build and building permits and housing starts. So if jobless claims jump up like they did at the most recent announcement, it would start showing and emphasizing the need for the Fed to pivot. Everyone's been waiting for something to break. A lot of analysts were like, something the market's going to break. And when that breaks, the Fed's really going to pivot. And so if we're going to start seeing a, a jump up in initial jobless claims, CPI and PPI continue to come down. And then we've just had what just broke in the banking system. We're likely to see basically a very strong move from the Fed and at least a strong move in prediction in the market for pivot from the Fed. So something to watch out for. Yeah, I, I just my own, just thinking off the top of my head right now, I'll be interested to watch in his reading the tea leaves when he speaks. Um, are they still going to keep talking about getting inflation to 2%? Is that still a target? Is it still something they can achieve? Definitely think it's still a target, but they, I, what I think is they're probably going to see that if inflation keeps coming down, then, and CPI and PI keep coming down, that they might not need to sustain the rates or keep increasing rates till it gets down to that point. They might be able to keep rates or even cut rates a bit to and maintain it there for it to come down to and have its desired effect. Awesome. I mean, that exciting week. Well, if you've been enjoying the content, please do subs consider subscribing. Take a deep breath and transition into some other stories here. Um, this is related a little bit just because of all the banking stories that were in the headlines this week, but Kraken, this came out earlier in the week before all this went down and Kraken wants to launch its own bank. And this is a quote from the Scoop podcast. I think this was one of their lawyers talking about it. I forget his name right now. I'm sorry. I should have that information, but Kraken bank is, well, Kraken bank is very much on track to launch very soon. Oh, Kraken's chief legal officer, Marco Santori told the block. So they're poised. In planning to launch a bank, I guess what they're trying to do is launch it in as many states as possible at once. And so it's a little complicated. They've been working on this a long time and they seem like they might be getting close. So maybe a little relief in terms of crypto friendly bank. It mirrors efforts from the circle that had, has been discussing doing the same thing for quite some time to help back their USDC collateralization. So very interesting. Could be a big move from Kraken. Another important thing that Jerome Powell said a lot during his speech and during his testimony last week was basically comparable regulation for comparable products. So essentially saying stable coins getting regulated the same way that currency does and centralized exchanges, which are essentially banks being held to the same standards as banks are. So uh, this is quite interesting. I don't know if that's comforting or not, but when I think of Kraken, it looks like they're trying to go in through the front door. It just seems like the front door has some mean guards in front of it right now. Yeah. But I do have some luck and I'm hopeful because like I said, it's hard to put money into crypto right now, especially in the United States, at least especially where I live. So I'm cheering yeah. for him. That's for sure. Yeah, exactly. So Kraken seems to maybe be taking that message from the Fed and from Jerome Powell to heart and saying, okay, you want us to run our exchange like a bank? We'll become, we'll launch our own bank. Let's, but at the same time, we're having different messaging coming out from Joe Biden and the U S treasury department, the U S treasury department and Joe Biden have proposed a 30% excise tax on crypto mining firms, basically charging them an extra 30% for their electricity use compared to other, any other form of electricity use. And with the goal of reducing mining activity and its associated environmental impacts and harms. Yeah. This was an interesting story that came out this week. Now this is his proposal is considered unlikely to pass as it is written, especially with a Republican controlled house. But this proposal does indicate Biden's fiscal priorities as he prepares to announce his bid for, for right for president, basically. So it's like laying the groundwork of what he's going to be running on. Uh, so it is interesting, but yeah, like 
this is probably not happening anytime soon. Uh, they're taking, they're throwing a number out. They're saying they not the only well, number that he's thrown well, out. He's also thrown out doubling the capital gains tax to 40% yeah. in the U.S. And right. he's talked about over the next 10 years, doubling taxes on certain, I forget exactly what goods, but certain goods. So this is, that's just some of it. But he's also announced a provision to close the wash sale rule, a loophole in the tax code of basically people selling their stocks at a loss to cover their capital gains, but then rebuying them 30 days later. And this was mainly for crypto because you didn't have to wait the 30 days. Yeah, a lot of people do use that. It's annoying that they're going after that. So that that's big. That's not the only big thing. I keep, we keep saying that there's more big things. There's more big things. There's even more. New York General's Office sued Qcoin over the last week. And as part of that announcement, there was a kind of Easter egg, which included ETH as a security in that description and part of the reason why they were Qcoin was being sued. The attorney general, but she's basically alleging, yeah, also ETH is a security. It's interesting just seeing government officials take stances. It's really, it's very funny because they, the, the three cryptocurrencies that she chose to list were ETH, Luna, and UST. Like, why include versus Luna and UST are such different assets. Like, Luna and UST were, like, they collapsed. They were, they're, essentially, there was fraud with those tokens. Whereas ETH is... Pretty respectful, pretty decentralized. Not a stable coin. Not a stable coin, not an algorithmic stable coin. So very different. And this kind of will continue the debate on what cryptocurrencies, especially E. Oh my God. We, I didn't even put this story in, but the, what, the CFTC, he also spoke and he was talking about E as a commodity, I believe. Yes. No, he stuck, he stuck his foot down and said E. Bitcoin and stable coins are under my jurisdiction. So this is a huge battle jurisdictionally that are going on between essentially the SEC and the CFTC, who, and even the Fed to a certain degree on stable coins, whose jurisdiction do they fall under? And there, this is going to be a huge battle to see who wins. And in my case, I really hope it's the CFTC because if, ETH is not a security and stable coins aren't a security, then we'll see stuff like BUSD be allowed back on the market. And some of that huge, it'll help clarify that regulatory picture so much. Oh, we, we need so much clarity. Yeah. I'm looking forward to some clarity in the regulation market. Just something like the XRP case coming to a finale, actual laws coming into place, banks, like Kraken, there was another bank, I forget the name, but banks trying to come in through the front door and they're able to. Looking forward to that day. I think it's coming though. The adoption, it's like on one side, there's this choke point going on, but on the other side, there's just this massive adoption going on, and it just doesn't seem to stop. And we can kind of transition into some bullish stories. But the first one, Amazon will launch its own NFT platform on April 24th. Yeah, they're launching their own digital marketplace as they're coining it. So basically they're basically furthering their, their adoption of digital assets. They've really said that they wanted to get into the space and now they're going to be allowing your Amazon customers to be able to buy NFTs tied to real world assets. Yeah. They've kind of lagging with this, but there's a date, April 24th. So keep an eye out, but it, so if this all happens, available on the Amazon website under the Amazon Digital Marketplace tab, 15 NFT collections at launch and will not require crypto to purchase. Also in this story, it was reported that it will only be available in the U.S. at first. So for U.S. users of Amazon, keep an eye on the date of April 24th as it approaches. Might be a chance to get in on some Amazon NFTs, some of the first collections that are ever available on there. Yeah, they're trying to position themselves as a trusted intermediary and does a huge amount of shopping on Amazon for a lot all of their other goods. So Amazon's decided why not for NFTs as well. 
yeah, and at the adoption with NFTs that's going on is just really interesting. To the utility of NFTs and how they're being used. And we can jump right into this next story. Snoop Dogg co-founded Web3 streaming platform Shiller. And there's talk of NFTs in this one. Yeah, it's basic mining Web3 tech with live interactive video and audio streaming. So it's just for streaming, live streaming. And it's going to provide a one-stop shop for creators with NFT projects, artists, brands, opinion leaders, and basically allowing them to monetize their following and connect with their audience. So it's aiming to launch in April and there's... April's a big month. Yeah. NFT. Huge month. And it's going to allow approved creators to enjoy a suite of tools to monetize their content. This is... Another yeah, check out some of that ability. features includes ability for creators to go token gate their video and audio, share products from commercial sites, promote popular NFTs. They can receive tips and virtual gifts from their audience, which can be cashed out as fiat and engage with their audience through emojis, chats, split screen voting games. The app also allows cre creators to create their own token and digital passes, which can be featured on the Schuller marketplace and marketed within live audio video shows. I don't know. This is just super cool. It is massively cool. And also in the, it says they already have assembled an army of approved creators ready at launch. So this thing could take off fairly quickly. Yeah. It could be, it could become a real competitor to Twitch or YouTube even, maybe even TikTok. You'll see, we'll see, but on a little bit more bearish side, Hyobi, who we've talked about. A number of times on the show, their token collapsed by more than 90% this week. Yeah, like a flash crash. Fla yeah, it's honestly, flash crash. And then Justin Sun, who was a co-founder but no longer is CEO of HUOB, created a $100 million liquidity fund for HUOB. Interesting. Duh. I'm not sure exactly what this will mean for Hyobi long term. It essentially had to do with a large liquidation of leveraged positions caused by a few users. We'll see what happens because it dropped rapidly, but then rebounded just about just as quickly. It pulled almost 307 million positions across the market. So that was uh, pretty, pretty nuts. The only thing. I would add, I'm not really, I don't use Roby or anything, but yeah. got your keys there for going. It's running off exchanges, not financial advice, but careful out there. Yeah. So that was a huge, not bear, like bearish news, but not great news, but we should get into some crazy chain news. Cause. Oh uh, yeah. There's a big story coin. A really interesting story on a broader scale, but in the Bitcoin ecosystem. So Rollkit project, it's called Rollkit, introduced an infrastructure for deploying rollups on I'm really curious your take on this. Rollups would be huge because two things about Bitcoin is it can be expensive to transact and it can take a while. It's slow. So if, from my understanding, this is going to allow rollups just like we're talking about on Ethereum to basically help reduce Ethereum fees on Bitcoin and not only on Bitcoin, but using EVM technology. So allowing at least some level of interoperability between Bitcoin and Ethereum and all of the chain built on EVM. So this is incredible for Bitcoin because it could mean a whole new reason and a large ability to actually transact on Bitcoin. Yeah, when, when I read this, what it makes me imagine is potentially DeFi on Bitcoin. Is, it, is it, that what? Not so much. I wouldn't say DeFi on Bitcoin, but a reason and an ability, like a whole new layer of being able to use Bitcoin and for much cheaper. And... Yeah. Also, a little bit part of the story was the implementation was possible due to the taproot upgrade. So this was the most recent, one of the most recent Bitcoin upgrades. I think it was the last one. And Ordinals, Ordinals usage on Bitcoin for publishing arbitrary data. That was interesting. Just that, that 
And I remember when the tap root came out, one of the things that was mentioned is that it will allow some of the things that you see on smart, it will allow smart contract functionality in the future. Like it makes it possible for it to be developed. Not that it's coming soon or anything like that. And it opens the door to it. And then seeing this roll kit project makes you think, oh, this is happening a little bit. Yeah. So this is like opening that door. I wouldn't say it's there yet. It's opening the door though, for sure. But if we go on to Binance, they've had a whole bunch of news from there. He announced that they're moving their $1 billion innovation fund from stable coins to Bitcoin, ETH, and B. They basically cited, CZ cited the changes in stable coins and banks basically make it feel less secure and they're moving from BUSD to native cryptocurrency, basically cite, specifically gonna... citing Bitcoin, B, and E. So some of the fund movements are going to be on chain, but some of them will also happen on exchange. And we're seeing, we have seen some big candles from them buying overall. And so this is, this helped fuel some bullishness in the market. Bitcoin, CZ feels better holding his assets in Bitcoin, ETH, and BNB than he does holding them in stable coins anymore. That's a huge state for the market. Yeah. And then there's some pending buy pressure. It's like, oh, billion dollars. And then there was a tweet from Look on Chain that a billion dollars was moved from the Industry Recovery Initiative to Binance. But like, I'm not sure if any purchases have happened yet. I haven't found any confirmation to that but yeah super curious and watching this one yeah if you like this content please subscribe we really appreciate it and don't forget to comment we'd love to hear your thoughts and on how we take some of these topics and if you think this big move from binance is really incredibly bullish for the market or the nothing burger let us know well, below this continues to make news the Binance NFT marketplace has officially added Polygon support and now supports Binance, Chain, ETH, and Polygon NFTs. Although when I read into it, it's a little bit muted. Currently, only select collections are available on the Binance marketplace, but they'll integrate more. And some specifics, by holding Matic in their spot wallets, you can trade NFTs and users will also need to hold Matic in their spot wallets in order to withdraw the NFTs. Interesting. Just detail. Yeah, but that's just to pay transaction fees. Yeah, you got to make sure you have Matic on Binance. It looks like that's how I on their exchange. It. Yeah, but I think what's even bigger for the Binance chain is Pancake Swap, which is probably the biggest, if if not the biggest chain, basically DeFi project on Binance. They mm -hmm. Announced their airdrop, an airdrop of 135,000 cake and an exclusive NFT for supporters. So, that yeah, I read into this a little bit. You have to have pre qualified. They announced it and it was like, you have to have already had money, at least $500 in certain pairs BUSD, RAP, BNB, USDT, RAP, BNB. BTC B and RAP B and B and ETH RAP B and B have to already, but then you'll be eligible for the airdrop. And if you qualify for the airdrop, I think you automatically qualify for the NFT. And if you qualify for those, you can add more liquidity to qualify for the additional airdrop. So, yeah. So that's huge for, for buying the Binance chain as a whole to be able to afford to do this kind of airdrop and to see this kind of continued building is massive but that's binance isn't the only one that's doing big things avax has just announced a big partnership with esports organization tsm so yeah. that's massive huge and subnets come up with this one this is really interesting tsm is a global esports video game a creator and also their creator and creator focus company and blitz the company's competitive gaming platform are going to be leveraging Avalanche to, their quotes, revolutionize the gaming industry. The collaboration names Avalanche as the exclusive blockchain partner for TSM and Blitz. The partnership will be built on a dedicated Blitz subnet, which I thought was super interesting. Seeing subnets become, there's basically like, you have roll-ups with ETH and Avalanche is building subnets. And 
where is the adoption going to come from? It's almost there's a little bit of a battle going on there. Yeah, exactly. So bring company in, and this is a big company, and this is gaming. So yeah, there's and there's a lot to think about here. And it's the like second or third big partnership for Avalanche. We we were we've been raving about Polygon That's partnerships fun. for months, and yeah. Avalanche has just been like slowly sneaking under the radar with these big partnerships with Amazon and now with TSM. That's massive. I'm very excited to see what's going to come for Avalanche. Maybe a dark horse in, in this next bull run. He's kind of talking about Cosmos, ETH, Matic, but Avalanche is kind of, they're building quietly, but building and they're making pr pretty big partnerships. So Interesting just to see what happens. That said, Hedera Hashgraph, HBAR, has come back online after a hack triggered a suspension of the mainnet. There, an undisclosed amount of money was of token was stolen across the Hashport bridge, and it in included liquidity pool tokens on SaucerSwap, Pangolin, and HeliSwap. They quickly shut down the uh, the bridge after suspicious activity was detected and but they didn't confirm the amount of tokens that were stolen but they had found the root cause of the problem and it's back up and bl took a hit but seems to be rising i'm not following it too closely but yeah it seems to have survived for now yeah and then I guess the last little piece of news we previously reported on Logan Crypto Zoo and that whole rug pull fail project failure whole rigmarole. Well, Dowmaker basically took the idea and to essentially shove it in Logan Paul's face and prove that it can be done quickly and efficiently has basically completed building Crypto Zoo as under the name Degen in 30 days he on his youtube channel he basically pro posted new updates every day and they've successfully launched their beta mainnet it's already gotten over 115,000 wallets registered to join the game with pledges of over 700 million so that's pretty massive and a little bit of a Good move by, by Dowmaker and good for the crypto space as a whole. Yeah, it's nice to see the community stick it to them a little bit. I don't know. It's interesting with influencers. We love to hate on them a little bit. Yeah, as we create content ourselves. So it's very. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's interesting too. But it's cool. It's a fun little story. Yeah. So that's about all of our stories for this week. Thanks for listening and have a nice rest of your day, everybody. Thank you for listening. Yeah, it was an exciting week. I'm looking forward to next week. I can't imagine it's as big as this week, but yeah, you never know, man. It might be bigger. But thank you for listening to Decentralized News. We post to YouTube first, so please consider subscribing. Catch up to catch the videos as soon as they drop. Our goal is to provide unfiltered content that helps to foster genuine discussions to help the entire space grow. Please remember, this is not financial advice. We are not financial advisors. This show was presented for educational and entertainment purposes only. Please do your own research before making any investment decision. Thanks for your support and stay tuned for the next episode.